Okay, we are on session number three, hour number five, with Glenn Feithelm, who's still five or six hours away from a record here for an interview. But, uh, we have, at this point, gotten most of the way through his Vietnam tour, but we have the last phase of it yet to cover. Uh, so, you can kind of pick up your where. Uh, okay, after um, 11 months in Vietnam, uh, you know, it was a 12-month tour, uh, I'd seen some of the things that had gone on out in the field where uh, infantry units had had some real problems because officers didn't have much experience, they didn't know much about the North Vietnamese or Viet Cong, and uh, sometimes the lieutenant type over forward observers were not too sharp on reading the maps. You know, there were ROTC officers that figured, uh, that, you know, this is just a class I'm going to. If my life and death is not going to depend on it. They found out later on that it did. Uh, well, anyway, I decided that uh, I could go out as an artillery recon sergeant, which was the NCO version of a forward observer after a unit had been pretty badly mauled in the uh, Onlo River Valley. That did, you know, an experienced new officer who, you know, basically had to spend the rest of his life in a mental institution after he got back. Right. Because, be because of the losses that he had. Right. And uh, also, um, you know, they didn't have a forward observer with them at the time. So I said, I told our battalion commander, I said, I will extend if you get me a job as an artillery recon sergeant. I said, I would prefer first the 8th Cap because this was the unit that I heard so much about, I'd seen stuff about them, and they seemed to be one of the one of the better units in 1st Brigade. And he said, well, uh, you sure you don't want to stay and work in intelligence and operations? Because I was doing a real good job for him. This was Vernon Gillespie, and I said, no, I'm only going to extend if I get an artillery recon sergeant job. Okay. Now, I think at the end of our previous section, you talking about your response to that unit being mauled in the Anmo River Valley. Yeah. Or you had kind of lost it there for a bit and they had to kind of take you aside and Oh yeah. And pull together. And so but after that basically so you so you kind of just pull yourself together after that and Oh yeah. I uh, the next morning I was I was able to function normally again. But uh, they they had to kinda uh, send me to La La Land for a few hours because you know, they're talking about moderate casualties. Well, that was true, moderate, when you're comparing it with the whole 1st Cavalry Division. But I had just seen the dead and wounded, mostly dead from this unit, and there was nothing moderate about what I'd seen in that helicopter. And, you know, the I wasn't looking at the big picture like, you know, I'd been trained to do at that time. It was emotional. and. Uh, uh, I got too emotional in the in the talk, and they decided, you know, they probably would be better off sedating me and having somebody else run the radio, uh, the radio rack, and so forth until the next day, which is what they did. And after that, I came back, but you know, there was still a lot of guilt that, you know, if these guys had had a good forward observer with them and some experience with them, they might not have made the mistake. They might not have been hit by this. North Vietnamese company from the back, they may not have focused just on the three Viet Cong that walked into their ambush. Uh, but I figured, you know, I can I can do a good job out there for them. So that entered a lot, you know, guilt entered a little bit into my thing, you know, like I've been over here almost a year, I know the job, I know the Viet Cong, I can do a lot better job than a crispy new second lieutenant. So uh, anyway, I, I asked for the job, artillery recon sergeant, which you know was um, a bit more hazardous than what I'd been doing prior to that. And uh, of course, I uh, when I extended, I told uh, told my mom kind of a fib that you know the army decided they needed me for another three months. I didn't put that I'd volunteered for this, and also what I'd volunteered to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I after that I just started telling her about sunsets and asking questions about family back home and, you know, I remembered the Christmas with and Easter and, you know, those types of things. They got 
uh, very, very whitewashed as far as the letters that went home. Uh, there was one person that did get a little bit more accurate picture, but uh, and that was Lisa Medendorp, who worked for the Muskegon Chronicle. Uh, my mom referred to her as Glenn's hippie friend, but she didn't really talk to her at all. And I knew the fact that, you know, my mom was not going to even think about asking Lisa if she got any letters from me. So uh, she was the only one that had even the biggest idea what I was doing uh, towards that uh, tail end. Now, this is now late in 1966? Uh, 1967. 67. Yeah, because I, I got over there yeah. in November of 66. So this is starting the beginning of November of 67. And uh, my first day out in the field, um, they, uh, the company had been back, you know, at LZ English, but they'd already gone back out again and were doing some patrolling in a bunch of mountains called the KGIPs. And uh, there wasn't really a place where they could drop me off right where they were. So uh, they dropped me off where I could go ahead and, and go up the side of the mountain and basically intercept them. And, you know, being a map reader and stuff, I, I knew I could hit the right place, and uh, I did. And uh, I didn't really get to know any of the guys during that first half day I was with them, because they were on the move and basically hacking their way through the jungle. But I did know that they were uh, uh, later on going to quiet down and sneak in behind this village where they thought uh, supplies were being brought in from the South China Sea and in sampans up the river to supply the Viet Cong. So uh, we were supposed to sneak in behind this particular village at night and watch for them to do that type of thing. Um, I uh, didn't really get a chance to talk to uh, many of the guys, like I said, but I did call some artillery fire in that night, tried to make it look like it was just interdictions because I didn't want them to figure out that we were already up there. So uh, I just fired a few rounds and uh, it turned out later on that uh, at least one of those rounds had been in their vicinity because we found some bloody bandages there and later found some more bloody bandages in a hut, oh, well, probably seven, 800 yards from there. So, um, you know, I had some effect, but uh, that, the following morning, um, like I said, we're on a hillside behind this village and uh, we were supposed to get resupplied. They didn't resupply us the night before because the you know, helicopters coming in would have given away our position. So in the morning, helicopters came in, dropped off some sea ration things, but the helicopter came in on a hillside. And of course, the rotor blade goes across like this. Uh, we had um, a guy that, uh, by the name of Walter Bentley, had actually briefly met him the day before, and uh, he'd been doing point man part of the time, in other words, hacking through the jungle. He was a little bit overtired. He uh, carried a sea ration case away from the helicopter, and then decided he was going to go back and mail a letter. Well. Uh, he ran back towards the helicopter from the uphill side and went right into the rotor blade. The guy's name was Walter Bentley. And uh, his, you know, uh, the uh, officer Staley staff journal says uh, uh, EM while running to the helicopter from uphill side uh, hit main rotor blade, decapitated head. And that's what it said in the Daily Staff Journal. Well, uh, Bentley's mom sent some angry letters to Captain Canetto. Why did you set up there, you know? My son got killed, you know? Well, uh, Canetto actually felt pretty guilty about that for a while. And it wasn't until one of our reunions when I explained it to him, I said, you know, we were supposed to be parked on that hillside. We were supposed to be behind that village. And I said that uh, you didn't, you weren't the one that decided exactly where that helicopter was going to set down. I said, uh, Sergeant Gary Wilson was the one that actually brought that helicopter in. And he brought it in on the side of the hill, close to where 
all the stuff was going to be distributed and you know rather than guys carrying it up the hill and I said that decision was made by Gary Wilson it wasn't made by you and uh, I said uh, you know you didn't even see this guy when he walked into the rotor blade there were some other guys that saw him and screamed at him and uh, but uh, you know Canetto wasn't close enough to actually see the thing happen but you know ran over there after he heard what happened and they had him wrapped up in a poncho and the boots sticking out and um, you know what and that's the kind of thing where people in an air and mobile unit are supposed to know basic safety procedures around helicopters. Yeah, uh, that you never approach from the uphill side. And although you do approach from the side, normally you don't do it on the uphill side. You come at it from the downhill side or, or straight from the front where the helicopter pilot can see you and you know he'll give you hand signals if you've got to be down lower. But... Uh, in this case, the guy was running to the helicopter, a little overtired from the day before, and didn't stop to think about what he was doing, and went right into the right into the main rotor. And uh, like I said, you know, it was it was one of those things that I was outside the perimeter looking at the blood trail from the artillery fire mission that was going in at the time it happened, and I heard Bentley is dead, and I'm thinking. I didn't hear any gunfire, you know, I was mentally dead. And then they told me and I thought, you know, there's a whole lot of ways you can get killed out here. And, and you know, it, uh, it was kind of striking me that this could be a very long four months. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a kind of a hard realization, but I can't say that it, really bothered me for any long period of time. I still remember exactly the situation and you know I had not have it not seen Bentley when he got hit with the rotor blade but seeing him after he'd already been wrapped up in the poncho with the, the blood running out of it. I, I remembered seeing that extent of Bentley but uh, I didn't didn't see the incident actually happen. Some of the guys that actually saw it happen it would have been harder on them mentally for a for a period of time, especially if they yelled at him or warning, and uh, but uh, uh, anyway, we went uh, we went from there on several other uh, several other missions. One of them uh, that I remember most distinctly is in November was the one that I wrote about with the helicopter going down in front of us, and you saw the the five page thing I wrote on it. And uh, that one was, was tough on me too because I'd seen the helicopter come in the first time and almost stall when it pulled out. I thought either the pilot is trying to fly beyond what his ability is or there's something wrong with that helicopter that it's not performing quite as well as it should. And I was worried about that helicopter stalling out and the second pass it did, it fell back into the trees uh, and uh, we ended up charging across the rice paddy to rescue the crew and of course that meant I had to move artillery fire a little bit farther away because I didn't know where the crew had taken cover if they'd even gotten out of it because you know when it dropped out in the bushes I couldn't really see whether Anybody, you know, got down on their knees and ran away from it. I could just see all this smoke and stuff coming up. Now, what was the context of this? Okay, the context of that, uh, yeah, that's, that's true. That they haven't read the, the story, but the context was that uh, uh, we'd gone in, we'd surrounded a village, we'd done a cordon mission, uh, we'd had a couple firefights early, earlier on, you know, that... Uh, that day and uh, two days before. But uh, we were just walking along this uh, gravel road. It was um, middle part of the day. The sun was coming down. I remember it was pretty hot at the time. Uh, third platoon was in the lead. They'd gone past these uh, two rice paddies and were starting to enter the pine trees. And about that time, there was some Viet Cong that fired from a village that was across the rice paddy on our left-hand side. 
Uh, the fire seemed to be mostly directed at the headquarters group because there were more antennas sticking up from the RTOs there. Uh, there were probably only two of us in 1st Platoon that had antennas. Me, because I was artillery recon sergeant and Lieutenant Reed's radio operator. But uh, anyway, the fire came into the company CP area and uh, we initially took fire or took cover behind the side of the road, which was raised up above the rice paddy a couple feet. And we were, you know, away from where the fire was coming from and setting up a, you know, where we could have a base of fire. And uh, Captain Cadetto was going to do a normal fire and maneuver, and he figured his maneuver unit probably ought to be third platoon because they had the cover of uh, some trees since they'd already gone past the rice bag. So he's, he ordered them to start moving forward there and we were going to put down a base of fire. He had me uh, call an artillery fire on the edge of the village and also on the left hand side, which I did. And uh, then this aerial rocket artillery unit showed up. Now they're the ones with uh, 24 rockets on the side. For, so we're talking 48 rockets. They, uh, these were the C models before they had the uh, Cobras. Mm -hmm. So they had 48 rockets on a, uh, tw or 24 rockets on a side, a uh, total of 48. And uh, they, uh, you know, put down a lot of rockets. And uh, Anyway, they made the made the first pass, and then I, you know, I kind of yelled out the warning to uh, the uh, um, uh, ARA, which is Aerial Rocket Artillery Section Leader, because that's the one I could talk to. Told him, I said, you know, the second ship almost stalled out that last time. I don't think you ought to make another run. Well, I couldn't hear the helicopter to helicopter talk. But I imagine that it was probably something like, uh, no, I'm just fine. Don't listen to that dumb infantryman. He doesn't know what he's talking about, kind of, kind of thing that was going on between the second helicopter pilot and the, and the, the section leader. Well, the second one came in and, and stalled out and crashed into the, into the trees. Well, uh, Captain Canetto thought, well, so much for our nice laid out plan of fire and movement, you know, we got to get over there and rescue the, the crewmen if they're still alive. So basically what he ordered was a charge across the rice paddies. That would have included his CP group plus a platoon that was next to him, plus first platoon, which was the bunch that I was with, towards the left hand end. And uh, we went ahead and charged across through uh, muddy rice paddies about knee deep and it's really kind of hard to run that way and it doesn't do much for your pulse and blood pressure and all that other stuff when you're running and getting shot at and there was uh, one Viet Cong that was over in the trees on the left hand side and he's going from tree to tree and occasionally taking a pot shot at us well uh, I fired three rounds I think all three of them were misses because my heart was beating so bad at the time. But anyway, he apparently decided they were close enough that he'd better find something else to be doing. And I didn't remember seeing him after that. Also, I put some artillery over there to give him another concern. But uh, because on the left-hand side, I could fire, but I couldn't fire near the edge of the village right straight ahead because we didn't know where the, uh, where the crew had gone. Well. Uh, we were getting across there and I put in fire on one of the bunkers that we'd gotten fire from and uh, it had collapsed the bunker and there was a, a wounded Viet Cong that was trying to climb out of the bunker and the guy that was with me, a guy by the name of Hillary Craig, uh, took a shotgun and basically finished the guy off and I went to grab the pack and weapon and he says, Leave the stuff alone. We've got, you know, we're too much in a hurry. And I thought, yeah, he's right. You know, gathering intelligence is not what we're, what I'm supposed to be doing right now. We're still looking for the for the two guys or three guys that might have gotten out of the helicopter. 
So uh, anyway, we moved on. They found one of the other guys, one of the other platoon uh, platoons that found them. I think actually Canetto was with them. And then we found the, uh, the co-pilot, and he was down on his knees. Um, he was pretty smoke blackened and stuff. And he'd been vomiting and stuff, and uh, you know, we sort of got him calmed down. He wasn't seriously injured. He was definitely suffering from smoke, in, smoke, in, smoke inhalation and uh, possibly a compression fracture of the back. And he also had a uh, broken wrist. But uh, so anyway, uh, Doc Atkins, you know, splinted him up and uh, they said something about the, the crew chief. And we started looking around, and one of the infantrymen saw some legs sticking out from underneath the helicopter. And he ran over there, he says, we got another guy underneath the helicopter. Come on and we'll roll it off of him and pull him out. So a bunch of infantrymen are leaning up against this helicopter, which is smoking. It's still got some live rockets and explosives on board. And everybody's putting their shoulders into this thing. Uh, rolling the helicopter off and uh, anyway we got it rolled up enough so that uh, Doc Adkins and one of the other guys were able to pull the crew chief out from underneath there and they uh, they dragged him you know a little roughly probably you know long axis drag like you're supposed to but uh, you know kind of quickly and they moved probably 30 yards maybe away from the helicopter and I thought, you know, why did they take him so far from the helicopter? I'm thinking, yeah, it's got all those smoking explosives on the side yet. So it, it started to make sense and when they got, got him laid down, uh, Doc Atkins says, uh, said to me, he said, uh, Tutu Mike, can you help me get his helmet off? And I grabbed the sides of the helmet and pulled it open a little bit and rotated the helmet off in case he had a neck injury. But, uh, uh, and underneath the helmet, his skin looked pretty normal. Underneath his Nomex gloves, his skin looked pretty normal, but he looked sort of like a overdone steak on the face uh, because all of the burning fumes from the helicopter fuel. And uh, Doc Adkins went ahead and tried doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth on him and had nothing but, you know, charred flesh and pieces of flesh and uh, he realized it wasn't going to, nothing was going to really work. And I remember him being on his knees kind of looking up at the sky with, you know, God please give me somebody that I could at least do something for, you know. But he had this, this you know, kind of lost look on his face. And uh, I was uh, uh, in the process of thinking, you know, he probably, probably needs a hug. And the tendency was to go over there and give him a hug. And I, you know, there were tears coming down my face too because when I pulled the guy's helmet off, he had a picture of a girl in there, dark-haired girl, uh, named Carol. Don't know whether it was his wife or his girlfriend. In a short timer's calendar, this. This guy just had a couple of weeks to go before his tour was going to be up. And, you know, I felt really kind of frustrated by this situation. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll open my camera. One of the guys says, no, you don't take pictures of the dead guys. And I said, no, I'm not, not going to. And I walked over and took a picture of the helicopter. And I still do have a picture of the wreckage of the helicopter. But, uh, you know, I, I just had to sort of get away from this thing and let the tears come down behind my camera and focus as best as I could and get the picture of the helicopter and I did. And as uh, I got a little bit more uh, composed, I heard notice some, the, some more gunfire farther back in the village. Now what had happened was that uh, Thomas Calkins from 3rd Platoon had gone through the trees on the right hand side and actually got behind the Viet Cong and he was shooting towards them. Well, some of his rounds were coming towards us and of course we had guys shooting that way too. And so Calkins ended up having to 
you know, hit the ground so he didn't get shot by her own guys. Because, you know, the bullets was both ways across where the Viet Cong were, and Hawkins was on the other side, you know, served as a backstop for things. And so anyway, he hit the ground, and uh, we got over into that area, and there was a, a bunker between several of the huts. It was kind of a rounded top thing, and uh, I uh, got up against the bunker and was initially going to just toss a grenade into it, and I thought, yeah, but there might be some civilians in here, too. So I flopped down against the top of the bunker, pulled a pin on a grenade, held the grenade so it could be seen from inside right over the doorway, and uh, yelled, light eye, uh, and uh, um, anyway, uh, to get them to come out. And uh, eventually there was some movement down in there, and an old man came out, followed by a bunch of civilians. And uh, the interpreter asked if there were any more Viet Cong or any more people down there, and the, the, the older guy said no. So I pitched the grenade in, you know, just to make sure. And uh, that there were no bad guys that were still hiding in there. And uh, anyway, the old guy, it turned out, had uh, fought during the time the French were fighting over there and, uh, you know, was sort of a village elder in this group of people. And uh, after, the, after the fight got over, helicopter came and picked up the, the wreckage of this uh, ARA helicopter and we moved on. A day or two later, we went back to LZ English and showered. But, that was uh, that was one of the fights that I remember distinctly in November. Now, air assaults were kind of uh, uh, hit and miss things. Sometimes the bad guys were there, sometimes they weren't. But uh, about five minutes before the infantry went in on an air assault, there would be artillery that would fire on this field or hilltop or wherever we were going, and uh, the artillery would come would be coming in and then the last round that they, each artillery battery fired was supposed to be a white phosphorus round. So if there are two batteries firing, we're supposed to be able to see two white phosphorus rounds uh, hitting the LZ, which would indicate they're all done shooting because helicopters didn't want to go in and land and unload troops when there are still artillery rounds in route. And uh, sometimes, you know, if there weren't, I wouldn't see enough white phosphorus rounds, and I would be standing on the skid alongside of the helicopter and reach over with my M16, slap the uh, pilot up the side of the head, you know, because wearing a helmet, and he'd turn around and look at me, and I'd wave, go around, and, you know, okay, uh, you know, there's something that I know about that LZ that says, it's, you know, supposed to make a circuit before he drops this off. But uh, most of the time, there were the right number of artillery rounds there, and we uh, would jump off onto the ground. The door gunners, uh, the helicopters that we rode were called slicks. They looked a lot like the Huey that's sitting on the pedestal down there by Mona Lake, except they had an M60 machine gun hanging out each side. And uh, those were the types of helicopters that our first lifts would go in on. Subsequent lifts would sometimes come in on Hueys, sometimes on CH-47s, which were the twin rotored helicopters. Now, when a CH-47 ran a daily trip around the artillery bases, uh, we referred to that as the school bus. And uh, for guys that weren't familiar with the CH-47, they quickly got familiar with the fact that uh, if the thing is landing somewhere near there, you better hang on to your helmet too because the, the wind blast when the thing was bad enough, it would lift the helmet off your head and send it flying. I mean, it'd pick up water cans and bounce those around. I've got a picture of, uh, of that happening too, but uh, uh, like I said, mostly we went in out of uh, regular Hueys. Now, um, let's see. Uh, the next big fight for uh, 
uh, first the eighth actually we gained information on it. Uh, we made an aerosol into the mountains between the Bongson Plain and the Antelope River Valley. Uh, this was first platoon of Delta Company. Lieutenant Bob Reed was in charge. And we had a prisoner that had been picked up that was going with us. And, uh, uh, you know, he knew where there was uh, a, a place where the Viet Cong quite frequently stopped and also the North Vietnamese stopped uh, and would meet with the Viet Cong. Well, uh, we got fairly close to there and we were talking to some villagers that said, yeah, there's some North Vietnamese that went up that way last night. Well, while this conversation was going on, one of the infantrymen was looking with my binoculars at this ridge and he says, yeah, we got three or four people up there and he says, uh, Apparently one of them has got some type of a mess kit and he said uh, he seemed to be set up and not too worried about us. Bob Reed says, well, let's make it look like we're going away from there. So we got on a path and made it look like we were walking away from that particular ridge. Then he had us drop down into a stream. They had bamboo growing along the side. Well, we got down into the stream, we are about waist deep in the, in the stream, which was relatively clear water because it came down from the mountainside. There was actually a waterfall up on the mountainside above that. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, uh, we followed the stream and it got us up close to the base of this ridge. And he had us deploy into a skirmish line. And he said, uh, Tutu Mike, I want you to go with the bunch on the left-hand side. He says, it'll put you on higher ground first. But he said, uh, I want you to put artillery fire up where you know they saw the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, and he said, uh, keep it going until we get up real close to it. He said, since you're on, going to be on a little higher ground, you might be able to see some of us in spite of the heavy underbrush between the rocks. So uh, I went up there and uh, there were uh, some North Vietnamese and Viet Cong that were having a meeting. Uh, it was actually a planning meeting uh, so that the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were going to attack the town of Tam Quan and hold it over the Christmas truce. Well, uh, we didn't know exactly what they were doing there when we went out, but uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as they overtook the area, uh, there were primarily rear area North Vietnamese troops, which were sort of an easy battle for a line infantry. Mm -hmm platoon like Bob Reed's, which was a real sharp infantry unit. And uh, it was a, kind of a one-sided firefight. And Bob Reed says, well, we have what we think was their CP uh, under control right now. He said, uh, go ahead and start bringing in the left flank. And as I was coming in, there was a uh, uh, North Vietnamese sort of popped up in front of me. And I didn't think there was, you know, I was wondering how he got there so suddenly because I didn't see him walk in there. Well, uh, I fired a shot at him as he ran off and I cut him across the ass cheek. And uh, another one of the guys had a better shot at him and, and killed him. Uh, but I went to where this uh, North Vietnamese had first appeared and I thought, okay, how did he get here without me seeing him? And I thought, I wonder if there's maybe a cave entrance around here. So I started poking around the bushes near the base of uh, kind of a rock wall. Lo and behold, there's the entrance to a cave. And I pull my flashlight and shine it down inside. And, uh, I can see the edge of a great big, you know, a metal box like the old milk boxes they used to have on their back porch years ago. They were metal bound and they had some insulation inside. So I told uh, one of the other guys, I said, you cover me and give me your 45. I'm going to go check it out. And I uh, dropped down into the entrance to this cave. And, you know, here's some North Vietnamese web gear hanging on the side. Of course, that sort of runs up the, the blood pressure and pulse rate real fast because, okay, where's the guy that belongs to that? You know, I just dropped into his cave. He knows where everything is. I don't know where anything is. And it turned out that he wasn't there. He'd gotten out of the cave, 
and my artillery fire had kept him from getting back there to pick up his web gear. Well, uh, I uh, checked these metal boxes and checked around for booby traps and I, they were okay and I thought, well, gee, I wonder what's in these. And I looked up the top and in the top of one of them there's some North Vietnamese guidons, you know, they're triangular flags like you see Custer and the cavalry coming to the rescue with in the old-fashioned movies with the cowboys and Indians. Well, anyway, I found one of these guys, uh, actually there were two guidons and a North Vietnamese national flag in there. And I grabbed the top guidon, which says Quick Ten, which means roughly resolve to advance, which was the motto of the 8th Battalion, 22nd Regiment. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper, put the piece of paper in there for intelligence information, everything that was written on the flag, and drew a quick sketch of what it looked like, and set the flag inside of my shirt. This is going to be my war trophy. Mm -hmm. Well, I mailed it back to my sister and, and labeled it Scarf. She was going to West Michigan University at the time. And, you know, for some guy to send his sister a scarf seemed reasonable. I figured if I labeled it North Vietnamese flag, some rear guy was going to pick it up and so much for my war trophy. Well, it, it got back to my sister and she kept it and then I put it on my wall at home. And after a number of years, uh, I stopped at West Point. Notice they didn't have a whole lot of North Vietnamese stuff like that there. And I said, uh, would you like a North Vietnamese guide on it? He said, well, there weren't any of those that made it back. And I said, would you like a North Vietnamese guide on it? And he says, you got one? And I said, uh, yes. And he immediately went up and got a registered mail box. <laughs> and so it was sent to West Point. It's on rotating display there right now. But uh, so that, uh, that flag did make it back along with uh, uh, the web gear. I, I uh, took the grounding 9mm out of it. It was uh, made by English Company in Canada. And it's too bad that pistol couldn't talk because it would have had a lot of stories. Like I said, it was made by English Company in Canada for the Nationalist Chinese back in, I think, 1942. And so it had been used by them when the Communist Chinese took over. It probably was on some Communist Chinese uh, officer's web belt for a while and then when the Chinese started making their own pistols uh, it got passed down to the North Vietnamese and I understand the last person that it belonged to before I liberated was uh, the pay officer for the 8th Battalion 22nd Regiment uh, but uh, anyway I carried that the rest of my tour in Vietnam was not able to uh, bring it back stateside uh, because I couldn't get back to the rear in time to get the paperwork processed. And we're talking a semi-automatic pistol. And did this raid succeed? And did you capture some of these people who were at the meeting? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, it, in, it included not the pay officer. We understand that he had a pack full of money and we never found him. Now, if we had, the money probably would have been used uh, by guys in 1st the 8th for getting their laundry done and stuff like that, we probably wouldn't have turned it in. I mean, Bob Reed was known as Lieutenant Reed and his bandits for good cause. <laughs> uh, uh, he had a real problem with uh, the uh, operations sergeant, a uh, guy by the name of Dave Wright. And I've got a picture of the two of them, both of them are, are smiling. And one of the other guys said, seeing Dave Wright and Bob Reed both smiling in the same picture is practically unbelievable, you know, because they were almost at each other's throats most of the time. Uh, I remember one time Bob Reed had, you know, the, his platoon was back in the rear and uh, some of the guys had uh, gotten a little bit feisty back in the rear and he had me go out with him. And, pull his guys out before the MPs came to get them. And, uh, you know, I was, I was sober and I was in the platoon CP at the time and he got the word that some of the guys got in a fight in one of the NCO clubs someplace. So we went and dragged those guys back before the MPs dragged them back. And of course they would have delivered them to uh, uh, 
course, heard the first class write, who would have uh, probably made sure they were written up for various charges of one type or another. And Reed wanted to keep his guys out of trouble, so mm -hmm. we might have got them first. But uh, uh, Bob or uh, Sergeant Wright, still at reunion time, referred to Lieutenant Reed and his crazy bandits. And mm -hmm. he didn't think Lieutenant Reed was much tighter wrapped than most of the guys that he ran with. And they, uh, they had the, uh, when the platoon was out on an ambush, they used the they used the call sign, Chinese Bandits, and uh, Reed thought that was a very appropriate call sign for Reed's Punch. And that, that name had actually come from a Long Range Recon Group, which we had several guys that were put in Reed's platoon. Um, and, you know, they were, they were some real aggressive soldiers. Uh, but uh, probably not too much to have in the rear area. One of them was a guy by the name Joe Musio. And Joe was uh, uh, actually from Dwajak, Michigan. He hosted one of our company reunions. I went down and helped him with that. And uh, one of his uh, squad leaders uh, later on became a prosecutor down in uh, Louisiana. And he's the one that did the eulogy for Joe Musio. And I remember one of the closing comments, he says, uh, uh, Joe was a fantastic soldier. He was not the type of soldier that you would pull out if you wanted to have a parade or something. He, were, he was one of those types of soldiers that you would like to mount on the wall with a sign up above, in case of war, like break glass. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, you know, that's the type of guy Joe Musial was, you know. He was, uh, he was a bit different. And uh, one of his earlier exploits uh, uh, with the company, this was before Canetto was even company commander, uh, the, uh, Battalion S3, this was prior to uh, uh, Major Burba, but he was, uh, Battalion S3 flew in, he said uh, to, uh, uh, the company commander, is, uh, he said, uh, you know, you've got troops down there bathing with no cl no clothes on down in the river. And uh, the company commander said, uh, no, I don't. He says, I, I know where all my troops are and there's nobody downstream. And uh, anyway, this S3 officer said, uh, well, you hop in the helicopter with me, I will show you. They went ahead and flew over, and lo and behold, there's these naked bodies laying on the rocks down in the river. And the company commander said, uh, could you take us a little lower? He says, uh, those aren't Americans, those are, those are Vietnamese. And of course, the S3 officer said, why are they naked and why are they laying out in the middle of the river on the rocks? And uh, uh, of course, the company commander didn't really want to say too much about what his suspicions were, but uh, the previous day, Joe Musial had had an ambush out near there, and they caught some North Vietnamese who were crossing the river and were coming out. Well, uh, Musial's platoon went ahead and gunned them, stripped all these North Vietnamese uh, down, folded up their uniforms like they were going to be washed and stuff, you know, and laid them along the side of the laid them along the side of the path, and then put all these bodies out on the rocks. Well, the S3 officer said, I want those bodies buried. And, you know, whoever was responsible for it, they're going to go down there and dig graves for these guys. Well, uh, Joe Musial took his platoon down. They did dig some graves right behind these nicely folded uniforms, and then he put death from above cards on every one of the uniforms and left them right there alongside of the path that came out of the river. It was like warning for any Viet Cong, you know, look out, we're, we're here. But they did have death from above cards and uh, uh, Joe Musial carried a whole bunch of those. I remember several other guys that carried large stacks of them. I think I only had three and I've got one that's still in my 
collection of homeless photographs, but uh, um, you know, I, I was not too much into that. And we were told not to use those because uh, CBS News had had a uh, camera crew over there and uh, the camera crew had taken a picture of uh, one of the guys putting the death from above card in this Viet Cong's mouth and taking his boot and pushing the guy's teeth shut, you know, around it. And apparently uh, this was seen back stateside as, uh, you know, very, very unfavorable. Mm -hmm. So uh, officially we were not supposed to use death from above cards, but uh, they were still occasionally used. And like I said, a few guys carried whole bunches of them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, they had actually been started by uh, Captain Bill Mosey from Charlie Company, 1st the 8th. He lives in the Duluth, Minnesota area, and uh, he and I still correspond back and forth. But uh, his, uh, his mortar platoon leader came up with the idea, and Bill Mosey went to Barnes and Bigelow and had a whole bunch of them printed up. And, uh, and they showed up at first the 8th, and for a while they were okay. And then, of course, after this CBS News report, the word went out, you know, and officially we were not supposed to use those anymore. So uh, their, their use declined, but they were still used occasionally. Might have worked in an earlier war, but not one on television. Hey, yeah, it, uh, and that was, that was it, you know. The, uh, to go ahead and uh, uh, take a pen or fasten it to the top button of some Viet Cong's uniform, you know, the death from a card. It's, you know, what we frequently did would make a little slit in the card so it slip over the button. Okay. So how long did you actually spend doing this for Observer? Uh, I did that the last four months. Okay. And uh, I was involved in the Second Battle of Tan Quan. And then come January of uh, 1968, uh, we got Agent Orange once in the Onlo River Valley real bad. A number of guys were real sick and were actually taken out of the field that same day. Uh, also that day, uh, we were being led by a fourth platoon leader that none of us can remember his name. I just refer to him as Lieutenant Lost because he couldn't read a map. And that particular day, uh, he'd been lost most of the day. Uh, engineers were dropped off where we weren't. And he said, oh yeah, we've got the LC secured. I said, but sir, we're nowhere near that mountain. And he said, don't worry about it, we'll, they'll be okay. And I watched this helicopter, you know, it's probably 1,500 yards away, drop these guys off on another mountain. And, uh, you know, like, these guys have got a whole bunch of explosives, a couple M-16s, and 45s. They're supposed to blow up this North Vietnamese underground hospital complex. And, of course, they think they're, that we're right around them, and we got them secured. Well, they look around, and, like, now they're out in Indian country all by themselves for about 40 minutes until I got over there with the squad and said, Okay, just follow us, we'll meet the rest of the platoon. Well, it was late that day, and uh, we were supposed to meet up with the rest of the company. And uh, the lieutenant says, well, uh, we won't have a problem getting there because we'll just go back on the same trail we did getting out here, because we know where we left the, the company, and then just follow their trail back up to where they are. And I'm thinking, okay, that's an awful long way around, and it's going to be dark before we catch up with them. Some of the infantrymen figured that out, too. They said, two, two, Mike, is there a shorter way we can get back to the company? And I said, yeah, there is. And they said, uh, we'd kind of like you to lead the way because we don't want to follow that lieutenant the rest of the day, especially after it gets dark. And uh, it was practically a mutiny, but uh, it, we were kind of late when we got back to the company area. And uh, all of this time, Captain Canetto was getting chewed out by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dubia, who was the battalion commander, a 
about why haven't your guys got this hospital complex blown? Why, why did they not have the area secured where the engineers were? And of course, Captain Gennetto can't do anything about it because he was several kilometers away from where 4th platoon was most of the day. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, one the lieutenant says, well, it was all a guy by the name of uh, Barrett's fault, and, or Barrett's fault. And uh, uh, anyway, Barrett was a black guy. And uh, Captain Canetto, after hearing Barrett's story, says Barrett is saying that the lieutenant is a racist. And he called me and he says, you think the lieutenant is a racist? And, he's, and I said, no, why? And he said, well, Barrett's filing a racism charge against him. He says, I'd rather not deal with one of those. And uh, he said, uh, what really went on today? I told him what had happened about this lieutenant getting lost and that he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And I said, that's what really slowed us down. And he said, well, what about Barrett taking off after some Viet Cong without permission and getting called back and not coming back? And I said, well, I was with Barrett and I said that there were two Viet Cong that crossed in front of us and we took off after them and Barrett said, wanted to keep going after them and I said, no, we can't do that because the lieutenant has called in a location that might not be right and they might not clear my artillery fire mission because they're so far away from each other. And he, he says, you mean we might not be able to get artillery fire? And I said, yeah, that's right, Barrett. And he says, well, I guess we better turn around then. So anyway, we turned around and went back and the lieutenant had stopped on the path. He had the rest of his platoon stacked up behind him and they're just basically sitting there doing nothing. And you know, Barrett and I and Barrett's fire team came back up and we got in line. And shortly after that, we got sprayed by Agent Orange and, uh, you know, because we were in the wrong place. And uh, then he said, well, sounds like the lieutenant made quite a few map rating errors. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I remember when we went back to uh, on K at Christmas time where he said he was at a certain location. And I remembered having to straighten him out, you know, and he said that, uh, you know, Canetto had called him up and said, well, if that's where you are, you ought to be able to see the green line from there. The, he said, also, you're, if that's where you are, you're standing in an old French minefield. And uh, he had the lieutenant pop smoke so somebody could go find him and bring him back to where the company was. But uh, anyway, uh, towards the end of this conversation with uh, Captain Canetto, he said, well, if you don't think he's a racist, do you think he's incompetent? And I said, well, yes, sir. And he said, well, uh, this guy's been out a month and a half. And he's not learning his job, and he's still making some of the same mistakes. And he said, I think he's incompetent, too. I'm going to have him replaced. Well, so a little bit later, he calls the lieutenant up, and, you know, the lieutenant comes to his uh, CP, and he says, uh, Lieutenant, I'm sending you back to the rear. He said, uh, you made too many mistakes to be a platoon leader in my company. And this lieutenant said, well, I can read a map at uh, 30 miles an hour out of the turret of a tank. This guy had been an armor officer someplace. And Captain Canetto said, well, that may be true, but out here there are no road signs. And he says, you're going back to the rear. And you know, that, was, that was the last uh, we saw of Lieutenant Lost. Mm -hmm. The story was that uh, he was given the job of uh, brigade sanitation engineer, which uh, basically was the officer in, in charge of, uh, you know, making sure the garbage was properly disposed of and the ship was burned properly. <laughs> but, uh, uh, don't really know whether there's any truth to that, but I heard that from one of the other, one of the other infantrymen. But uh, so Canetto was not above getting rid of incompetence if he had them. And he did get rid of that lieutenant. And the rest of the officers we had were all pretty good. Now, Captain Canetto thought Reed was probably the best in his, uh, he thought Lieutenant Barrick was good too, but Barrick was wounded. 
and uh, his replacement wasn't quite as sharp as Barrick was. So his second choice after that was uh, Nelson DeMille. Nelson DeMille is a very famous mystery book author. Uh, one of them was turned into a movie called uh, The General's Daughter. Um, but uh, anyway, he did Nightfall and a whole bunch of things. Mystery authors are quite frequently familiar with uh, Nelson DeMille. He's written a lot of mysteries. Uh, usually one of his main characters is a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the Vietnam vet is based on the composites of several guys that were with our unit. For instance, in Upcountry he mentions a fight between uh, a Viet Cong who had a machete and an American troop who had an entrenching tool. And the American with the entrenching tool wins the fight. Well, Hillary Craig had actually killed a North Vietnamese with an entrenching tool uh, while I was with them. And I said, uh, Hillary, what did you do that for? He said, never killed anybody with, it killed anybody with an E-tool before. And Hillary Craig was one of those guys who was a very aggressive soldier. I never saw him abuse a civilian at any time. Uh, you know, he was good there, but he loved being in battle. Um, he was very good at it. And he later on, uh, you know, had difficulty adjusting to civilian life for a while. So he was a guide up in the uh, Yukon area for a number of years and eventually uh, was building sets and, and huts up there for National Foam Board of Canada. And uh, one of them discovered that, you know, he was also a very good cook and uh, helped bankroll him to uh, open a restaurant in the state of Washington, which he did, which is called Alligator Soul. And uh, later on, his second wife was from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and they also opened an alligator soul in the historic district of Atlanta, Georgia. And the story behind alligator soul is, uh, you know, an alligator is an ugly creature, but it's still got a soul and personality that, you know, we ought to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And that was why the alligator soul, and, you know, uh, but uh, he died, uh, well, let's see. He, he uh, was awarded the Silver Star for fighting in the Oshawa after I left. Uh, he knocked out a tank with an M72 light ion tank weapon from the side. And, uh, you know, captured a lot of North Vietnamese equipment. As a matter of fact, there's a, a television thing where it shows the American troops coming back with a bunch of Russian trucks they captured in the Oshawa. And Hillary Craig is one standing it in the back of the first truck with his M16 in hand and this big smile on his face and a uh, uh, scarf flowing in the wind. But uh, uh, like I said, he was a real aggressive soldier, but real good at what he did. Okay. Now, was the uh, event uh, with Lieutenant Loss, was that one of the last things you did in the field? or? Uh, actually, uh, that... Uh, we fought the Second Battle of Tam Kwan. Uh, there weren't too many of us there because most of uh, Delta Company was kept to uh, look for the 18th North Vietnamese Regiment. There was one battalion that hadn't arrived and the idea was that uh, first the 8th would find them first, put artillery fire on them. So I really only spent uh, one night in the Second Battle of Tam Kwan. Now, during that time, I picked up a, a compression fracture of the spine, uh, some burns on one hand, and uh, also some lacerations from a bullet that bounced off the APC. None of the stuff was serious, but the fact that I was limping, somebody thought I was more serious, and they sent me back to uh, the hospital at LZ English. And uh, from there, I was supposed to go to uh, Quinn Yan, where they would get a better look at the, the back and determine how bad it was, and whether I ought to be in a back brace and I ought to be back in the rear, or whether I could go back out to the infantry company. Well, I wanted to go back out with the infantry company 
even though I still hurt. So I put my backpack frame on and it felt better with the backpack frame and the radio. So I went out to my company, but I forgot to make sure everybody knew that. And for a while I was listed as missing in action. Mm -hmm. They were looking for me at hospitals and they eventually got it straightened out, but I didn't get paid for my last two months in Vietnam. Uh, you know, December, well actually, uh, uh, December, January, and February, I didn't get paid for those until I got back stateside. So I couldn't buy another camera after the one got ruined uh, during the, the Battle of Tam Quan. So what actually happened to you at Tam Quan then? Uh, actually, uh, the compression fracture of the spine, there was a 50 caliber machine gun that was on this burning armor personnel carrier and uh, there were, a, uh, you know, we're getting shot at. This armored personnel carrier was burning because it got hit by a recoilless rifle and uh, there were other guys, one guy that was put in for a silver star there actually climbed into the burning vehicle and amputated the guy's leg at the knee that was trapped in there. And uh, of course I had some blood from him on because I helped, you know, bandage and put a tourniquet on the guy's leg. Uh, well, people saw all the blood on me and thought I was a whole lot worse than I thought I was because I knew I had a sprained ankle. I knew I had a sore back because I jumped off this armored personnel carrier with a 50 caliber machine gun across my arms. This is a heavy load of steel, you know. Not really good to be jumping seven feet and carrying this. So that was probably my first compression fracture of the spine. And I've done several since then with various things that I've done. But uh, Hamadi is not pleased with what my spine looks like right now. All right, we'll take this as a moment. This is now hour number six of the Glenn Sheet Home interview. Uh, we had now kind of made it sort of to late 1967 um, and you're getting in the last couple of months now of your Vietnam tour and now you're going to change your scenery. Okay, uh, after uh, December 1967 uh, we did a little bit of patrolling in the Amlo River Valley uh, in early 68. Now I mentioned about the lieutenant. Uh, he was replaced uh, probably a little bit before the middle of uh, January 68. And it was a week or two after that we got word that we were going to go up to the demilitarized zone and help the Marines uh, at Quezon. Uh, we boarded a C-130 at Elze English. Uh, when we boarded the C-130, one of the infantrymen decided to pull a typ typical infantryman's thing and he had a hand grenade pen in his helmet and he pulled it out and he says, anybody know where the rest of my hand grenade is? Of course, the uh, loadmaster on the C-130 turns white as a sheet, and you know, then he realized that he'd been joked, you know, on on this thing. But uh, you know, there was some real concern that someplace there was a hand grenade minus the pin rolled around inside that C-130, uh, and uh, but it took our whole company on board the C-130, and of course, uh, uh, the story from the, the C-130 loadmaster had told us that, uh, you know, we couldn't carry hand grenades. Well, Captain Canetto told us to go behind the Connexes and he said, I don't want to see a hand grenade outside of your packs, you know, when you get back on board the helicopters, or on board the C-130. So uh, we hid all of our stuff in there, but Captain Canetto was not going to leave any stuff behind. He, he knew that maybe when we got up there, they might not have enough ammo or grenades or anything like that. He was going to be combat ready you know, it's like uh, five minutes after we walked off that C-130, we were going to be ready to go into the field, which basically was uh, uh, what he was set up for. So anyway, we took the C-130 and landed at Wei Fu Bai, which is the airport at, uh, at Wei. And they loaded us on C-130s and flew us up to uh, near the demilitarized zone uh, place, uh, well, Quan Tri is the last big town mm -hmm. before you get to the demilitarized zone. There's small villages like uh, Qua Viet and Con Tien and so forth north of that. Uh, but uh, Con Tien got the name. 
Could you land a C-130 at Quan Tri, or did you take trucks up there? Uh, we took C uh, C-47s, okay. uh, CH-47 Helicopter. uh, helicopters okay. up to there, and they dropped us off. But uh, um, yeah, at, at Quan Tri, at the time, there was not a place where they could land a C-130 there. Later on, there was. Now, the Marine Corps had this attitude towards the first cab coming up there that we had so many helicopters, you know, it was just like mosquitoes swarming around. And our helicopters also were better armed than theirs were. Uh, and the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese learned that pretty quick that, you know, you can't just expect one or two passes from a gunship, but you can expect these ARL helicopters to come back, you know, six or seven times and fire rockets at you. Uh, so, uh, you know, the North Vietnamese found out some different things about the first cab. Also, we could move a lot of troops a whole lot faster with the number of helicopters that we had. Now, uh, one of the places that we worked off of was LZ Han, which was a mountaintop landing zone. Uh, the artillery battery was on the very top. The infantry was down on a kind of a ledge part way down. And uh, while we were on that ledge, uh, we had a mortar round come in one night that, uh, oh, probably hit about from me to the, the uh, copy machine over there from me. And I was laying in my hole, you know, it was at night. And I had a couple layers of sandbags. Well, I, when I heard what sounded like a mortar round coming in, and the, the pop, I didn't get up or do anything, I just laid there in the hole. The mortar round went off. Um, now, Lieutenant Kearney was laying in a hole probably about the size of that uh, table over there. And it had uh, one row of sandbags around it. And his pack was leaning up against the outside of the sandbags. And mortar round came down right on the, right on the pack and he had shrapnel from his ankles all the way up to the back of his neck. Um, there were two other guys that were wounded. One of them got hit in the neck, but uh, Kearney and the, the one guy that got hit in the neck by shrapnel were medevac. Uh, I was mostly covered with dirt and gravel, you know. No, no serious injuries of any type. Uh, but uh, um, anyway, uh, Lieutenant Kearney was flown out. He was the lieutenant type forward observer. Not real popular with the infantryman because he made a couple mistakes. One time he called in uh, uh, white phosphorus. White phosphorus doesn't fly as far as HE does. And he should have given, uh, you know, an add 75 to it. And instead he gave a drop 75. And the white phosphorus came down right on the right on the perimeter, and a guy lost his leg because of it. Um, so, like you said, he was not real popular with the infantrymen. Sometimes they'd say, uh, you know, Lieutenant Kearney is calling calling in interdictions around the perimeter, uh, and you'd see the infantrymen heading for their holes about like rabbits. And uh, so, some of the infantrymen were not real sad to see. Lieutenant Kearney go, you know, it's kind of bad that somebody got wounded, but they were kind of glad that he was gone, and that also meant that I was running the forward observer team. There was no lieutenant that was sent in to replace him for a long period of time. And uh, anyway, uh, the next morning, Captain Robbins, who was in charge of A Battery 2nd and 19th, which was the unit on the hill, he said, uh, have you got Lieutenant Kearney's binoculars? And I said, uh, no, sir. And he said, uh, uh, well, are they at combat loss? And I said, uh, yes, sir. The round hit right on his pack, and his binoculars were attached to the pack. He said, well, we need the serial number. And I'm sort of trying to sort through the various bits of shrapnel laying around for a green-painted piece of metal that's got a serial number on it. I said, well, this is, this is three digits of it, you know, and uh, I called that in and he considered that good enough. They marked off, you know, Lieutenant Curry's binoculars as far as being lost in, uh, lost in battle. And I said, uh, you know, I, you'd have to mark the compass the same way. And he said, well, for some reason or other, they didn't 
didn't ask for the serial number of the Alpha Cell just, uh, you know, go ahead and say, yeah, you know, that was, uh, that was destroyed when Lieutenant Kearney was wounded. Uh, anyway, we ran some patrols off there, and uh, one of the units called in that they shot a Viet Cong elephant. And uh, one, of the, one of the guys farther up the line says, well, how do you know it's a Viet Cong elephant? And I said, came back on the radio and I said, they said it was dead, so it's got to be a Viet Cong elephant. <laughs> And uh, you didn't you didn't say, well, we had killed some dead civilians or something like that. Uh, they were either Viet Cong or they were Viet Cong sympathizers, you know. Uh, so things things were run that way most of the time. Occasionally we did uh, uh, report, you know, civilians and stuff. And I kind of remember one time uh, we were on a patrol and. Uh, we came to a place where there was a village that the Viet, Viet Cong had taken. The civilians out were using them like porters to carry supplies. And there was an old woman and a young girl. Uh, a young girl had been, uh, apparently uh, was put by a fire in a blanket. The blanket caught fire and she was badly burned. And the, uh, the old woman, who I'm assuming was her grandmother, was staying with her while her Pretty much everybody else in the village had been moved out. Well, a little bit later when the company was getting ready to come in to the perimeter at a different location, I said, you know, about that girl that we passed up, I said, uh, would it be possible that uh, we go back and pick her up and then take her into Elsie English and have her flown to a hospital? And Lieutenant Reed says, well, we've got the rest of this patrol to finish, but he said, you can find some volunteers who want to go with you, you can go back and pick her up. So I asked and I immediately had volunteers and uh, we went back and picked her up and I remember we brought her into the artillery fire base and she'd been badly burned. The, uh, uh, the uh, medic from the artillery came over there because medic with first platoon was still out with them at the time. and. Uh, uh, I remember making chicken noodle soup out of, uh, uh, you know, a, a chicken and noodle sea ration thing. And I added some water to it and made, made a broth, you know, with a canteen cup. Because she was dehydrated from the burns, so I could tell, tell that. And we propped her up on a backpack and she was eventually flown out with the grandmother to a hospital down at Quignan. How she fared after that, I have no idea. But uh, you know, we we sometimes were in situations where we would go out of our way to you know help civilians out, and that was that was one of them that I remember as I was personally involved in it. Uh, but anyway, when we were up there near Quan uh, uh, Tree, we worked off of LZ and. And uh, LC, Betty, and uh, you know, there's several other ones we worked off of. And uh, then they had us go ahead and do some recon of the area between Quantry and the south side of Highway 9, uh, where we could put artillery batteries and kind of hedge, hedge hop over to help the Marines and Quezon. Well, uh, that was when the Tet Offensive broke while we were doing that. <coughs> so that, uh, that mission didn't actually take place until after Tet and I had left. By that time it actually pulled off. But they uh, actually did use two of the fire bases that I had reconned and said what had to be done. And, you know, there'd be suitable places where they could, you know, put some infantry on there and that cord and blow the trees down and, uh, you know, then bring artillery pieces in with CH-47 Chinooks and, and, and go to work. So uh, anyway, uh, when the, uh, just before the Tet Offensive, we had uh, uh, some heavy engines. We had a uh, five-man, what they called a killer team. It was out along the river, we were at Claymore set up, 
uh, supposedly the Viet Cong were bringing rockets down to fire on Vaughn Tree by raft on the Balong River. Now the Balong River is the one that, if you see the movie Bat 21, that's what it's based on is the Balong River where he got picked up. It's just south of the demilitarized zone. And the North Vietnamese took over that area during the 72 uh, in, in invasion. And also they basically held most of it during the Tet 68, except for there have to be some Americans standing on that ground. But they basically did control that area. And uh, so anyway, um, we had this bunch of heavy vehicle engines. and. I called on the radio, I said, are you sure there's not any South Vietnamese unit out here with tanks? Because I'm pretty sure what I'm hearing is tanks. And I said, no. And uh, anyway, uh, I had one of the guys climb up to a little ridge with a starlight scope. And I said, do you want to take a look and see what you see out there? And he says, oh yeah, there are definitely tanks and there's infantrymen with them. I thought, okay. We haven't got any good guys out there. They gotta be the bad guys. Well, we didn't want to get cut off from our company, so we quickly like, picked up all of our claymores and got away from the river and zigzagged, you know, a path. We did not encounter these guys on the way out. So by sound I ran an artillery fire mission on them. And I apparently damaged one because we found the following day that it had to stop to repair one of the vehicles, but it had been moved where it was better covered by the time daylight got there. Uh, I reported them as Russian PT-76 tanks. This is before the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. Military policy was uh, from Westmoreland's office, because it was military system command Vietnam, that information on North Vietnamese buildup in the two more northern provinces is politically unacceptable at the present time. And apparently CBS News might have had a copy of that because Westmoreland was going to sue CBS for defamation of character when they said that he had, you know, not been prepared for the Tet Offensive. And uh, uh, so they knew there had been some lies that were purposely spread around because of his office, so I'm assuming somebody had a copy of that, even though it was stamped secret. I didn't see it until a bit later on. But nobody uh, was informed of the fact that there was a Russian-built jet shot, shot down in South Vietnam, or that there were Russian-built tanks in South Vietnam. Now, these tanks apparently were supposed to have been used for the Tet Offensive, uh, towards Quan Tri, but their commander apparently saw the, the fact that the Marines had M48 tanks with 90 millimeter recoilless guns. He was basically outgunned. So they turned around and looked for a softer target, and there's a book called Tanks in the Wire, which is about Special Forces camp. They got hit by some PT-76 tanks roughly two days after we had seen them. and I'm thinking that it could have been some of the same tanks. Depends on how long it would have taken the tanks to get yeah, there. Yeah, you know, uh, it would have been possible for them to, to get there in two days, but uh, that's assuming they were able to run, you know, at a normal cruising speed at night when they didn't have to, you know, that they had lights out. But uh, anyway, the Tet Offensive broke, and most of, uh, most of the Americans were pulled back to guard the cities like Quantree. Our battalion commander, Donald Rattan, also known as Snapper Rattan, there was a LZ Snapper named after him when they finally pulled that uh, thing at Quantree, but uh, that was his nickname from West Point. And uh, he decided that uh, since we had some people that were real good at calling in artillery fire and some good platoon leaders, we had some of these guys had come from recon platoon, myself, he figured, you know, we'll leave you guys out there because North Vietnamese coming south to go after the, the cities might be a little sloppy because they figure they basically control that area out there. It's Indian country. Well, one night 
we did catch a battalion of them that were uh, getting supplies from underground caches and they were using flashlights to sort the supplies out. We were about 600 yards away, uh, the platoon that I was with anyway, and uh, I got four artillery batteries to power them and uh, the North Vietnamese lost very heavily that night. Uh, sort of uh, like the North Vietnamese were probably chicken little, the sky is really falling, you know, because four batteries of artillery, uh, they just pounded them for about 10 or 15 minutes. Started with the time on target for all of them. Their first rounds came in at the same time. And the infantrymen just, you know, gets on 2 2 mic, you know, they're watching through binoculars as this stuff was crashing in on them with the flash of the artillery. They could see these North Vietnamese just get torn apart by the by the artillery fire and they thought that was that was really cool. I'm thinking, you know, it was kind of strange. I've got a cheering section for killing people and I uh, come to find out I eventually got a bronze star for that too. And my sister said, but you're a hero, you got a bronze star. And I said, no, that's just for being very good at my job, which was making the other side die faster than we did. And I told her about that particular fire mission. I said that probably played a big part in that bronze star because uh, it was, uh, it was for uh, uh, January, February 68. Well, uh, the Tet Offensive, uh, we continued to do well against the North Vietnamese. Towards the end of the Tet Offensive, there were, uh, was one of these, uh, actually a couple of these North Vietnamese units that had been so badly hit, they were broken down and put into one company. And uh, it said there was a Viet Cong platoon guarding this uh, bunch of Viet Cong cadre. And uh, this was right after I left. They went and got involved in a battle with them. There were several of the guys that I knew pretty well from first seat that were killed in that battle. We had a new forward observer there at the time. And there was uh, the guy that they sent out his artillery recon sergeant, was not real confident. The lieutenant type would have been, but he was overly cautious because he'd been safety officer for his 30th mm -hmm. artillery before that. So obviously he did not want his name on a artillery incident thing where some people got killed by friendly fire because he goofed up. He was real careful about that made him a little slow get the first rounds in, but uh, uh, there was a guy by the name of Gary Nelson Fry that uh, ran the artillery fire for A Company 1st the 8th during that battle that actually kept one of his platoons alive because of the artillery fire he put in. And uh, uh, there's a guy by the name of Tom McAndrews who was company commander for a Company, 1st the 8th, that was really praiseworthy of this Gary Nelson Fry, who was uh, later on killed in the Oshaw. But okay. Now, let's steer back here to your story. Now, you get pulled out. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, I mentioned about running the uh, artillery stuff, and I did that throughout uh, the Tet Offensive, um, and uh, there was one night where some North Vietnamese had walked through one of our ambushes and they didn't spring the ambush. And I put some artillery fire to where I thought those guys went. You know, it did cause some casualties, but I didn't know the North Vietnamese had already had pre planned positions they'd already dug there, so um, it didn't do as much damage to the North Vietnamese as it would have if they'd been troops in the open. Um, the, during that day, the medic, uh, guy by the name of Atkins, knew that I was having trouble keeping up. I had dysentery, I had blood poisoning, I had all kinds of infections. I was basically a rotting piece of meat. I'd, uh, when I went to Vietnam, I weighed 195 pounds. At this time, I probably weighed about 130 and was, you know, not really in great shape. 
And Adkins and uh, Lieutenant Reed came to me and said, you know, you're going to take that medevac bird back to Quantry. You're so sick. Well, Adkins said you're so sick that within the next day or two, you're going to fall out. People are going to have to carry you. And he said, you also might make mistakes because you're not thinking as clearly as you should. And he said, I'm going to make my bag tag out for you. So they flew me back to Quantry. And the next day, you know, Atkins was right. I couldn't even climb up from the floor into this wooden bunk that I was supposed to sleep in. And uh, this was about a week and a half before I was supposed to leave country anyway. So that uh, first week I spent basically under the care of Dr. Risa and you know, they loaded me up with all kinds of antibiotics and cement pills to stop me up so I didn't have diarrhea. And uh, you know, I started putting on weight and I could actually walk by myself before Captain Risa turned me loose and he said, okay, uh, you go ahead and take a C-130 back to on K and you know, they'll, I'll process you and we'll be going back home. He says, by the time you get there, you'll be 190 days, so you get an early out. And uh, when I got back to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, they said, well, uh, you can stay here another month, we'll see what we can do about curing the jungle rot and the other stuff you got wrong, or we'll just write out a prescription and get filled back home, and you know, that'll, that should take care of you. If not, you at a VA hospital in Grand Rapids. So uh, I did that. I took took my early out and figured, no, I don't want to don't want to be treated here at Fort Lewis, Washington, to get assigned you know little duties that don't mean anything, like uh, I go out and shine the sidewalk or you know, whatever sort of nonsense that they might come up with. So I I took an early out from there. I flew from Fort Lewis, Washington uh, on a Northwest Airlines uh, Convair twin engine prop plane because I wanted to see some of the country at at least a lower altitude than I would from a, a big jet that would fly me directly from uh, SeaTac near Fort Lewis uh, to Chicago and from there to Muskegon. So I must have stopped about five or six times you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, or wherever, and Billings, Montana. And, uh, so I made several stops on the way back, and it, uh, it took me a whole day to, to get back on that. But did you fly in uniform? Uh, I did, uh, because I flew out from a smaller airport uh, near uh, Seattle, and uh, some of the guys didn't because there were uh, not there, but if you flew out of Oakland, there were people throwing rotten fruits and vegetables at you already, you know, in 68. So uh, I did fly back in uniform, and uh, I stepped off the plane and was skiing in uniform. Some of the guys, you know, figured that they'd get rid of their uniforms in Chicago and mm -hmm. come back in civilian clothes. I didn't. I actually walked off the plane with a, with a, a uniform on. Of course, since that was March, or actually tail end February, um, I had a khaki uniform on and a field jacket over the top because it was it was cold here. I mean, when we flew into SeaTac, it was cold and rainy too. So, okay. Now I want to back up a little bit and talk about a few different themes that tend to come up a lot. People think about uh, Vietnam. Uh, one of the stereotypes uh, has to do with, with drug use, for instance. I mean, was there much of that? Uh, anyone? Drug use. I mean, were there people smoking marijuana? Were things worse than that? Or? Uh, occasionally there was somebody that smoked marijuana, but it was always back in the rear area. Uh, the thing was that the guys figured that they couldn't get any ice for a mixed drink or something like that. So they smoked a little marijuana, got uh, got a little happy. 
Nobody ever smoked in the field in my unit. Uh, either 2nd 19th Artillery, which I was in earlier, or 1st the 8th. Now there was one guy in the combo section of 2nd 19th that I heard smoke marijuana, didn't actually see it. Okay. So it's not a many major part of your experience? Uh, no. It was, now later on during the Vietnam War, it was a bigger part. Uh, and I understand that was true even in good units like the 1st Cab and 101st Airborne. Uh, Ray Pointer, who was uh, a 1st Sergeant in the 1st Cab, was later 1st Sergeant with 101st Airborne, uh, I think 6970. And he talked about, you know, the fragging of NCOs and, and officers and the drugs and the drug problems, but I didn't see it during the time okay. I was there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, another one we touched on a little bit has to do with, with the question of race. I mean, you had the one issue there with the person accusing Lieutenant Lost of racism. Did you notice much by way of racial tension? I mean, you did when you were in Germany. Yeah. Because there was a sergeant that... Yeah. Uh, and that seemed to be mainly true of, it, of rear area troops. You know, when you were out in the field, uh, you relied on this other guy with the, with the rifle or machine gun to help you stay alive. Didn't make any difference he was, if he was black, white, or purple. As long as he was wearing our uniform, you know, you could depend on him. And, uh, you know, I saw uh, white guys going out and grabbing wounded black guys and hauling them back, and the other way around with uh, white guys wounded, black guys putting their lives on the line to go out and drag them back. Uh, you know, we, we didn't see that uh, out in the field. Now, I don't know whether I mentioned uh, Ling. He'd been, uh, he was Vietnamese, and for a while he'd been my interpreter when I was the second 19th. He was a uh, South Vietnamese uh, that could speak English. He was interpreter for headquarters, actually, the S2 for 2nd the 19th. And uh, he used to go out on these village sick calls with us and short range patrols. And I said, Ling, you only carry two magazines, you know, total clip together where the, the bottoms were taped together. You know, two 20 round magazines. You never carry web gear. How come? And he says, uh, Sergeant Shido, if it takes more than two magazines, we ought to be running, not fighting. <laughs> and I found that, that true of the, the South Vietnamese. They realized that they were in this war basically for their lifetime. And, uh, you know, if you have a chance of determining what this fight is going to look like from the very beginning, you know, you, you pick your fight so you got a good chance of winning. And uh, we tried to do that too, but the, the Viet, South Vietnamese or the Arvin were definitely more into that. You know, well, if uh, we think we can win this, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and attack. Or, uh, you know, like, let's see, there's eight of them, or eight of us, and 45 of them. Uh, Let's just slide off and find a find a fight with them some other day, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I did find uh, some differences in South Vietnamese troops. Some of them were very bold and brave. Some of them were so-so. Eh, uh, but uh, uh, one of my cousins who worked with the uh, Cambodian mercenaries against the Viet Cong really thought a whole bunch of them. Gillespie thought a whole bunch of the Mott Yards had fought on our side during the Vietnam War as far as being very brave. Uh, uh, there's a book called uh, Abandoned in Hell that was written about a battle in 1970 where the Americans were already looking at, you know, were pulling out of this war and uh, they uh, didn't send to resupplies and ammo that they should have to help out this bunch of Cambodians. But they, uh, with a couple of American advisors, they did manage to fight their way clear of this uh, Firebase Cape, mm -hmm. uh, which was right along the Cambodian border. And, uh, but it's a pretty good book about 
that time of the war and the fact that, you know, where a lot of Americans were beginning to look at, you know, I'm not really too sure about being the last guy to die in this war we're going to give up on anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas there was more gung-ho during the time I was there, you know, 66, 67, early 68. Now, after the Tet Offensive was when most of the guys said that things started going downhill. Walter Cronkite had come out on the news and said this is a war that no sense being there anymore because we're going to lose in the long run. Well, he didn't actually say that. Well, he, yeah, he, some of the, the, he declared it a stalemate, and that was as far as he went. You look, but that's a yeah. But basically, it was still as far as Lyndon Johnson was concerned, he had lost Walter Cronkite. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, and uh, but uh, yeah, Walter Cronkite had looked at it that uh, you know uh, this war is being mismanaged and is probably not going to come out well. And American people saw that, and of course they saw the Tet Offensive with the uh, Viet Cong getting into our embassy. Of course, the Viet Cong all died that got into our embassy, and uh, a large number of them died at uh, at Way, and they died at Quan Tri, and probably the biggest example of North Vietnamese dying was. Uh, at Quezon, you know, they had the, the Marines surrounded and pounded the Marines and caused Marine casualties. But there was there were more bombs dropped on the area around Quezon than were dropped on any German city during World War II. I mean, uh, the North Vietnamese admitted to losing uh, just under 200,000 troops, you know, that were supposed to be Taking over Case on. They didn't. I, that's not, okay. That's a different. Case. Yeah. Well, but they uh, lost a lot. Yeah. yeah they, they, the the North Vietnamese. You know, there was one general that admitted that that cost them close to two hundred thousand, and you know they were just chewed up by B fifty twos. You know, this was not artillery fire from the Americans, but just you know their trenches, the battalions coming south to reinforce the North Vietnamese. You know. B-52 strike and 400 some men was reduced to 18. You know. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess now the another question: How did the men in your unit, as you observed, how did they seem to view the South Vietnamese civilians? Uh, they were actually pretty good about the South Viet <coughs> South Vietnamese civilians. They recognized the fact that uh, you know we were going to be there a short period of time. Maybe the Viet Cong were going to take over at night, so that you know made them understand that the South Vietnamese didn't always get as free as they'd like to be about giving us information. Sometimes uh, you know we felt pretty good because the civilians did give us good information. Sometimes they just didn't say much of anything, but you know we we realized they were in a tough place, and I think most of the infantrymen felt that way, like. Uh, when we pulled into uh, a village, did a village cordon, the American troops generally would share their rations with the uh, Vietnamese civilians, particularly the kids. And, you know, they'd gather around and share a peanut butter jelly sandwich made with bread canned in 1943. And uh, peanut butter before it was homogenized, looked like a desert salt flats with a little peanut oil on top. Uh, yeah, and we only, I only remember one guy that was down on the civilians. Uh, he was our first sergeant, and uh, one time he threw a concussion hand grenade back on the kids that were picking up the supplies we had left behind. And one of the infantrymen threatened that this first sergeant might have an accident in the next firefight. And the first sergeant said, you heard that, he threatened me. Heard what, sergeant, you know, and I <laughs> just played dumb. But I, I knew what was going on and I knew why, this, you know, this guy was a bully, he was doing stuff wrong. We had uh, one guy that actually later on became a, a probation officer in the Denver area uh, who actually got ticked off this first sergeant punching him out 
one time, and he naturally got busted for doing so. And even Captain Canetto said, I hope you hit him hard because he says that guy was totally worthless. <laughs> and, you know, he, he knew that this first sergeant was uh, not one of our sterling characters. Okay, go ahead with your next Another question. piece of your story I wanted to go back to a little bit. Um, you mentioned at a certain point in your tour you had a job going around and talking to people after firefights or actions and finding, getting their different accounts of what happened. So you were essentially interviewing people. Uh, like yeah. Elsie Tony, I think. Was um, now that was. Uh, uh, early on, I interviewed some of the people that had been involved in earlier battles okay. uh, to write up uh, lessons learned for artillery on what we could do better with artillery fire to support the infantry. And of course, uh, the eye drag battles mm -hmm. were part of that. And then the May 21st, 22nd battle, which uh, uh, SLA Marshall wrote up in his book, right. Bird the Christmas Tide Battle. And SLA Marshall also wrote up David Dolby's Congressional Medal of Honor uh, thing, and he had some errors that were exaggerations in there. And I knew that because I knew that the artillery fire that they got there was primarily illumination later on, or the one artillery fire mission run by <coughs> Charlie Company's FO early on that drove. North Vietnamese out of some bunkers. But once the battle got started, the Americans and uh, North Vietnamese were too closely mixed up to effectively use artillery fire. And David Dolby didn't do that in spite of Vesely Marshall's praises for his good artillery fire and ARA and, and so forth during that battle. Dolby didn't do that. He was a brave soldier that put down one of the North Vietnamese machine guns that had some guys pinned down. He uh, took his lieutenant and hid the lieutenant's body where the North Vietnamese wouldn't find it and uh, uh, helped uh, get uh, some wounded guys down to the stream bed where uh, um, uh, first name was, was Bill. But, uh, anyway, uh, one of the third platoon leaders from Bill Mosey's, uh, not third platoon, but second platoon leaders from uh, Bill Mosey's company came up and helped get the wounded back from Roy Martin's platoon that had walked right in front of the bunkers and, and been hit uh, right at the start of the battle, which resulted in uh, David Dolby's uh, lieutenant getting badly wounded and then eventually killed during that battle. And there were a couple other guys that were hidden in the rocks and then not pulled back to the uh, not pulled back to stream bed and the next morning when Bill Mosey took his company there because his company was up to strength they uh, picked up those other two bodies but there were two of them that were actually left out in no man's land that first night and uh, one of the stories that got passed off that it was you know Roy Martin was a chicken for not being sure that those two bodies were policed up. Uh, he had information verified that those two guys were dead and uh, you know, the area was controlled by the enemy. Uh, it had turned dark. Uh, Roy Martin's platoon air company had, had, had taken some heavy casualties and uh, the decision was made that B Company pull up to the side of the valley where uh, Captain Bill Mosey had his company set up, and the next morning uh, they, dr they brought in uh, chainsaws and uh, lowered them down from you know, the helicopters, and the guys went ahead and cleared some trees so that uh, medevac helicopters could pick up the, the wounded that had been laying in Mosey's perimeter all night. So, you know, that's, that's how it went there. Now, when you were 
doing these sorts of, of inquiries? Were you talking to both officers and enlisted men? Yes, talking to both officers and enlisted men. Also, I had access to a lot of the uh, uh, secret documents and so forth concerning those fights, uh, which is why I knew that there was information out on that second battle in the Idrang, the one at LZ Albany, but uh, it was basically kept quiet for the first 14 years after, after the battle took place. And I knew it had been released in uh, 1979, which would have been a 14 years for the uh, secret classification to be renewed, re removed from that, mm -hmm. unless somebody had upgraded it to, to top secret. So uh, at Grand Valley, I knew that there was going to be information out there to write the report, the yeah, Idrang almost forgotten, which uh, uh, Grand Valley still has a copy of it. And uh, it apparently is available out there on the internet or somehow on the internet they know it's available because Hal Moore used it and uh, uh, J.D. Coleman used it in writing their books. So, uh, and when you were talking to people, did you have a, were they pretty forthcoming, or did you have a sense that people were holding stuff back? Uh, they were they were very forthcoming uh, because uh, they knew that this was going to help some other people out in the future, and anything that was going to help other people from going through the same type of hell they did in some of these battles was was worthwhile. So yeah, they were they were pretty open guys that I talked to, I mean, uh, Rick Rescorla being one, and you know, there were uh, several people, and Rick Rescorla reminded me a little bit like, that's probably what Winston Churchill was like <laughs> as a young man. Rescorla was a Welsh immigrant. He fought in the British Army prior to coming to the United States, joined the United States Army, went to OCS, got a got a lieutenant's commission and led an infantry platoon during uh, that second battle in the Idrang, which is one called LZ Albany. And uh, now he was killed during the World Trade Center bombing. He was um, uh, head of security for Morgan Stanley. Wow. And he'd been down in the basement, he'd seen the, the van that had blown up down there and said, you know, this building's still a target. And he said, uh, next time it could be an airliner. He says, we're going to have a have fire drills. Well, the big, big monkey bucks at Morgan Stanley said, no, 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 you're just a crazy, paranoid Vietnam vet, you know? And he climbed on the table and unfastened his belt. And he says, I'm going to moon everybody until you listen to me. And they thought, this guy's probably serious. So they said, OK, Rick, you calm down. Sit down and tell us what you think we ought to do. And he told them that they would uh, take the computer, clear everything, you know, have everybody that was there from Morgan Stanley check in and check out so they knew who was there in the building. And he said that, you know, different floors had different places they were supposed to go to. And uh, there would be security people that would check you know, with a clipboard and take the thing off every half hour. And so Morgan Stanley actually did practice that once where they went to other locations. The rest of the time, they just go to the doorways they were supposed to exit from. And, you know, the security people would take charge. So Morgan Stanley didn't shut down for real long periods of time other than that one fire drill. And, uh, Anyway, when uh, the, the plane hit the World Trade Center, uh, the uh, Port Authority said everybody stay put, the fire department will tell which floor to evacuate and you know, they'll do a nice orderly evacuation. And Russ Coral says, no, this building is coming down. Everybody head for the stairwells and you know, go to the fire drill procedure. And uh, it saved close to 2,800 guys, or 2,800 people from Morgan Stanley. And he stayed behind? Uh, he stayed behind. Uh, the last that anybody saw him that escaped, he was standing in the stairwell with his bullhorn, 
singing rather risque Irish drinking songs, as well as some patriotic songs like God Bless America over his bullhorn and telling everybody to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't know for sure exactly where he was when the building came down, but he, uh, he didn't survive that. He was later put, on for, put in for the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, a couple of guys that uh, actually circulated f petitions. Uh, uh, one of them was he, uh, General Hal Moore, uh, and another one was the guy that played uh, Hal Moore during the movie, uh, We Were Soldiers, Bell Gibson. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought that maybe he might get the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Well, anyway, Port Authority, uh, among others, kind of tried putting a monkey wrench in everything because he had been right when Port Authority and uh, Department of Home Defense had been wrong. That, you know, yeah, next time it'll probably be an airplane and, you know, we've got to have a evacuation plan in order. Well, Morgan Stanley was the only one that really did. And he'd saved most of the employees of Morgan Stanley. But uh, the fact that he'd been right and they'd been wrong, they uh, started a campaign against that. And I understand he never did get the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I've got about 12 minutes left in this tape. I'm okay, go ahead. Me. You would take, take other questions. Well, right. yeah, basically, um, once you got home, what did you do? Uh, first thing I did uh, was I wanted to do something that was positive. So uh, I had kind of thought a little bit about going back over there as a pacification officer. Mm -hmm. But I immediately got back into ski patrol, which was a search and rescue type of thing, mm -hmm. and actually got in my 12-day minimum during 1968 in March. And uh, so I was credited with that year, and then I had to take a review first aid class in spite of the fact I've been doing medic stuff, mm -hmm. but some of the stuff there didn't fit, the, you know, the rules on what first aiders were allowed to do. Right. So uh, anyway, I got upgraded on first aid and did that. I spent some volunteer time with uh, Summit County Search and Rescue and Pitkin County Search and Rescue on uh, some rescue things there. I uh, took up mountain climbing and, and backpacking in the mountains because of the sense of adventure, you know. You got to have some things that kind of put your mind on edge, but they have to be politically acceptable and uh, hopefully something that's not going to get you killed. Now that's part of the reason that some of the Vietnam vets got these high-powered helicopter or high-powered motorcycles and died shortly after they got back from Vietnam. They tried getting the sense of adventure out of this and, and died as a result. Did you want to go into college? Uh, I did go to college. Uh, I did uh, some time at community college here and went to uh, Western Michigan University where I got my bachelor's degree. Uh, then uh, got a master's degree in library science and AB media. Uh, that was mostly through Western Michigan and University of Michigan Extension Office in Grand Rapids. And then after I got the master's degree there, I uh, started working on a master's degree in history. And I took some classes from Western and some from Grand Valley State University, which resulted in a paper that I mentioned in the mm -hmm. I almost forgotten. Uh, and that was a paper I wrote for one of those classes. And the battalion commander started the uh, uh, instructor said, you can't find information to write a paper on that. And mm -hmm. I knew the stuff had just been declassified. Mm -hmm. I just had to find out where it was and uh, I you know started from there. Some of it I, I got the papers, some of it you know I was still waiting for it from mm -hmm. uh, National Archives at the time I finally wrote the paper. And then that information got passed on to Hal Moore and uh, JD Coleman both wrote books dealing with the Idran campaign. So, 
Now you're taking these degrees. Do you have a job at this point? Uh, yeah, I taught for Muskegon in public schools uh, starting in 1972 and uh, taught for them for 35 years. Uh, part of the time I taught fifth and sixth grade. I was in elementary libraries for a while and the last 20 years as uh, head of libraries and the media center at Steele School where I didn't actually get a chance to create a, uh, a video on a project the school was doing on uh, environmental improvement of the creek that was behind Steel School. Uh, that was uh, one of the two things that I, well actually the only thing I did with video that was actually part of my AV Media Master's degree. I did uh, a slide tape dissolve program on commercial fishing in the Great Lakes, which uh, uh, won some awards. Uh, uh, Fred Braille had uh, turned it in uh, at uh, West Michigan University for me, and they did pick up a couple of awards for outstanding slide tape dissolve program for a uh, AB program. It only got used a few times with ski in public schools, and then something happened to their spindler saw pay dissolve control, and <laughs> there was no longer the equipment that it took to run it. But uh, so, right. now you've also gotten yourself involved with veterans groups of different sorts. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see, and uh, oh, it must have been about 19. Uh, 1982, I started helping um, psychiatrists and psychologists with the rat groups. You know, I turned Vietnam speak into something that they could understand, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so I did that quite a bit. I actually probably did it for somewhere around 10 years, and I got to know a lot of the vets around Muskegon County. Mm -hmm. With that, I get thank yous from some of them. And some will come up and ask me questions, you know, even years afterwards. I had one when I was uh, out for dinner just uh, a week or two ago. And he was one that used to walk around the uh, house at night with the loaded AR-15. Uh, but uh, he doesn't do that anymore, according to his wife. But he's still more than a wee bit paranoid. And you can see it in his eyes, uh, but uh, he has not done anything real bizarre. Uh, he's functioning, uh, still feeling kind of bitter about some stuff, but he's, he's getting by okay, which uh, one of the things was that I had when I was helping run Grab Bruce was a sign on the wall. Vietnam changed me, but I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was, yep, Vietnam War changed our perspective on outlooks on what life was going to be afterwards. But, you know, you can't carry on like you still live there because it's totally unacceptable. Phil Margulies told a story about that. He was a psychiatrist who had been uh, in World War II. And he said, uh, yeah, you know, when you're invited for dinner, he says, uh, that's not the time to talk about, uh, you know, in the Ardennes when you, uh, you've been walking pretty hard, you were tired, looking for a place to sit down. He says, that's not, you know, at the dinner party, it's not the time you talk about stacking up these three German bodies and sitting on them and opening up your rations to eat. He says, that's the last time you'll be invited to a dinner party at that house. He said, there are certain things you just have to be careful of. The rest of the world doesn't understand what we did in Vietnam or anybody did in any war. And he said, you have to kind of, kind of pick uh, things that you say and do that are socially acceptable. That's what I talked to the other other vets too. Did you have to learn that yourself? Uh, 
Well, actually, I had been told some of those things by Fred Royce, uh, who had been a World War II vet, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, a couple of times when I started to get really hostile and mad, but cool it, you can't do that kind of stuff now. And a couple of times in first aid situations, okay, that's considered practicing medicine without a license. Mm -hmm. You know, you could get sued for that. Do not do that for the first aid thing. And you know, there were times I had to had to kind of restrain what I was doing. You know, like uh, uh, you know, um, students got a gun. Well, yeah, uh, but you can't go ahead and grab him by the throat and kill him right there. <laughs> that's that's. Uh, and I did have one uh, building principal that. There was a guy that he'd actually been kicked out of the Heights, and uh, the principal and I had walked him down. He was threatening to kill some student at the school. And we walked him down to the office, and I'd let go of him. And this guy pushed me from the back right in the corner of a file cabinet. And it uh, broke two ribs. But, uh, I mean, I kind of put the pain of the ribs out of my mind, and both hands, one around his neck, and lifted him up off the floor. And the building principal said, Glenn, you've got to let go of him. <laughs> and, you know, it was, yeah, okay. So you had some conditioned responses. Though. Yeah, uh, there, there were some things that, uh, you know, if I saw my life or, you know, I uh, threat to my my health by somebody, you know, it was, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and grab the guy around the neck and there was another time a kid came ahead and started hitting me in the chest and the idea about reaching out and throwing him to the floor and falling on him was there but I knew I couldn't do that, you know. Uh, I was going to get in trouble for, you know, when if I dropped on him with both knees in the middle of his chest. Uh, probably break a whole bunch of ribs and maybe puncture a lung and put him in bad shape and that was not really what I could do in spite of the fact the guy's slamming the heels of his hands into my chest saying, oh man, I'm going to make you have a heart attack. And, you know, uh, but yeah, there were, there were some things you had to just kind of put back, you know, no, I can't let, can't let emotions and anger take charge right now. I've got to handle this and stuff totally rational school teacher or whatever I happened to be doing at the time. All right. And uh, let's take this now that I'm done. I think I'll close out here and say you've got really a remarkable memory for this stuff and you reflect on it in ways I think that are good, people are going to really appreciate as they watch the story. So thank you very much for sharing the story. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, like I said, I'm still trying to work a little bit with uh, with vets, including this one that mentioned about having the anger problems, and I said, we'll get together with Sandwich out at Fair Market Park and have uh, supper out there and talk about it sometime. You know, there's not other people around. Right. So, Very good. Um, and I'm trying to do some things with